Okay, the purpose of this video is to compute the impulse response for the DC motor that we've been using as an example. And we're going to compute the impulse response from the transfer function. So, in fact, let's actually work out a plan of what we're going to do. So, uh, we want, we have h of s, we want h of t, where h of t is the inverse Laplace transform of h of s. So in order to take the inverse Laplace transform of h of s, the first thing we're, we will have to do is perform a partial fraction expansion. And this will get h of s into the form of something that looks like this, r1 minus s over p1 plus r2 s minus p2. And the idea is in the partial fraction expansion, we will compute the values of r1, r2, p1, and p2. Once we have the partial fraction expansion, then we just compute the inverse Laplace transform of each term. So for example, something that looks like this, you can easily look up in a table and see that this would have the inverse transform of r1 e to the p1t u of t. And similarly for this term. So once you get the partial fraction expansion, Getting the inverse Laplace transform of each term is easy. Then the last thing is to check um, and uh, think about or verify the answer. Doesn't make sense. So this is where we're headed. Uh, we'll go ahead and actually do it. So the first thing we need to do is the partial fraction expansion. So I've written down the transfer function and the constants that we're going to use. Um, we're going to use MATLAB to actually compute the partial fraction expansion. So this next little bit is going to be specific to MATLAB, although um, you can probably find similar information for other ways of computing the partial fraction expansion. So quite often we talk about the idea that we have a ratio of polynomials. In this case, n of s is just the polynomial 1. d of s, is the denominator polynomial, is this guy down here. And um, in order to use MATLAB to do the computation, we need to define a vector b, which will be the vector of coefficients of the numerator polynomial. And since there's just a single coefficient, b is going to be a vector that contains 1. In the denominator polynomial, things are a little more complicated. We have a second order polynomial. So we have a coefficient a2 for s squared a coefficient a1 for s, and a coefficient a0 for s to the 0, which is 1. So basically what we will do then is we'll define a vector a to be a2, a1, a0. And we'll plug these in to the MATLAB residue function, which gives us then a vector r, p, and k. And this command will give us a vector of r's. The r's, hopefully, as you will recall, are the coefficients in these terms. It'll also give us a vector of p's. And the p's are the poles or the zeros of the denominator polynomial. So if you look at this, the denominator polynomial is second order, 
and so it's going to have two roots. You'll remember that a root of a polynomial, in this case a polynomial in S, is the value of S for which the polynomial is 0. There's going to be two different values of S for which this denominator polynomial is 0. And because there are two roots, we well, because there are two roots, there will be two terms in the partial fraction expansion. You'll oftentimes see the roots of the denominator polynomial called poles, and we'll explain why in a later video. Well, the short explanation is that a value of s that makes the denominator 0 means that you've got 1 over 0, which is uh, undefined, but it's sort of infinite. and uh, uh, so when you actually plot h of s on the complex plane, or the magnitude of h of s on the complex plane, uh, you find these points where you get these things that go off to infinity, and those are called poles. It's kind of like the tent pole under a circus tent. Okay, so anyway, uh, we're at the point where we need to compute r and p. k in this particular case is going to be empty. It's not going to give us any useful information. We'll show in a later video what information you actually get from it that's useful. So let's go to MATLAB and let's define our constants first. So we have kt is equal to 0 0.2 newton meters per amp. And you'll notice that MATLAB doesn't like that because MATLAB doesn't know what to do with the units. It doesn't know how to handle units. It thinks that you're trying to get it to compute something, and it doesn't understand what you're trying to get it to compute. So when you're using MATLAB as a calculator, uh, you can't have it keep track of the units. You're going to have to keep track of the units yourself. So we'll type in all the values of the constants, assuming that we can type. Okay, and now we'll define the vectors. We'll define vector b to be 1. We'll define a2 to be l times il divided by kt. a1 to be equal to r times il divided by kt. And a0 to be kb. And then we'll define a vector a to be the components of the vector. And now we're ready for the magic invocation r comma p comma k is equal to residue b comma a. MATLAB thinks for just a little bit and gives us these values. So now we'll put these values back into our partial fraction expansion. Okay, so we go back to our drawing, and I'll blow this up because we don't need it anymore. We'll take our MATLAB values that we computed and put them over here. And um, we'll write out what the partial fraction expansion is. So we, whoops, that was not quite what I had in mind. Somehow, <coughs> that was actually... Uh, now you've just seen a preview of what we're going to have in a minute. Okay, so we have h of s is given by r1, that's this first coefficient, over s minus p1, plus R2 over S minus P2, which is that guy. Okay, and I'm going to just tidy this up a bit. I have two negatives, which gives me a plus. And I'm going to take these coefficients, this one and this one, and actually just put them out in front of the uh, 
term that they're multiplying just to make sure that it's clear when we take the inverse Laplace transform how that's working. So we get this expression with the coefficient out in front times s over or 1 over s plus this number. We know how to take the inverse Laplace transform of that. Okay, so here we are. We know how to take the inverse Laplace transform of these guys. And before we do it, let's check off that we've completed our partial fraction expansion. Okay, so using MATLAB as our calculator, uh, we have our partial fraction expansion done. We're beginning to get that glow that comes with accomplishment. So the next thing we need to do is take the inverse Laplace transform of each of these terms. So I'm just going to have this constant e to the minus 3.8601 t u of t. So that's basically this term right here. And uh, let's get another beautiful color for the second term. And that's the inverse Laplace transform of the second term. Okay, so there you have it. We've got h of t. So we can actually go to our list of things to do and check off that we've completed step two. We've made the inverse Laplace transform properly. So the only thing left to do now is to plot this and think about it, make sure it makes sense. So um, we'll do that. Okay, so I've created a plot of h of t. I actually used MATLAB to do this, but there's all sorts of different ways you could do this plot. And uh, the question is, does it look like it should? Well, uh, from my perspective, it does. Uh, you have um, that the, uh, again, this is what you would get as an output if you had an impulse as an input. And basically what the impulse does is it gets current flowing in the motor. That current flowing in the motor is then converted by the motor into torque. And that torque is used to spin up the, uh, the load. So up until this point, the load is spinning up. Now, unfortunately, you've uh, gotten rid of all of the energy that was stored in the inductor. It's now in, in the form of the spinning load. And then the resistance of the motor starts dissipating energy, and so the speed of the motor is going to, con is going to start to de decrease. So again, as a function of time, h of t looks like this. It starts at zero, it goes up quickly, and then starts to decrease. So with this h of t, if I really wanted to, I could find the output of the motor in response to any given input. It turns out there's easier ways to do that, uh, actually using the transfer function and the Laplace transform, which we'll show in subsequent videos. So that concludes this video.